For a couple months now, I've been thinking a lot about how much it sucks to use a battery that's any larger than like one of these in a makeup project. And while there's many aspects to that, today we're going to be focusing on the recharging part. Previously, with my Sumo robot that uses a 4S pack, I would have to unscrew a cover, take the battery out, and slap it on a big bulky charger in between rounds like everyone else does. And yeah, it worked, but in the back of my head, I knew that there was a much cleaner solution out there that would allow me to charge the battery at 2, 3, 4 amps through USB-C. All I had to do was just find it. And spoiler alert, it wasn't one of these, which can only handle one lithium ion cell in series. Or one of these, which, although it does support multiple lithium ion cells in series, is super annoying to configure even the limited configuration options, and also blows up if you connect a power bank's bidirectional C port on the other end of the cable. Not to mention the issue of, you know, the fact that you can't even draw the power it actually advertises. Because I wanted to do this the right way. I mean, once you get past the cable nightmare, the whole point of USB-C is that devices with the same connector are meant to work together and safely. And the fact that the TP4056 doesn't work with a Type-C to Type-C cable, and this IP2368 straight up melts if it's connected to another bidirectional C port, makes me wonder why they even put a Type-C connector on the thing. So if not these chips, what's actually inside our laptops and phones controlling battery charging and discharging through USB-C? Well, I think I have a pretty good idea. Every once in a while, Texas Instruments, yeah, that Texas Instruments, will release a reference design showing us how to implement their chips. And this one in particular is super interesting, even though it might not look like it. That's because in a size of about 40 by 30 millimeters, we can charge a one to four cell battery at five amps, up to 66 watts, and use that same battery to output up to 45 watts through USB-C in source mode or OTG mode, as we like to call it. Pretty much meaning that this tiny circuit can perform the functions of a fully integrated fast charging power bank, even if you're using it for something different. Since with the EEPROM chip on board, you can configure pretty much everything about the system. I'm talking charging profiles, wattages, power rolls, communication protocols, heck, there's even GPIOs on this thing, and a lot of them too. And just in case you think needing an EEPROM chip for configuration is bad, and you'd rather the competing hardware configured alternative, generating the software for our EEPROM chip using TI's GUI takes literally a few seconds and is orders of magnitude more versatile. So it was safe to say at this point, I was sold. But I obviously wasn't just going to buy TI's development boards and hook them up using a bunch of nasty wires. I say boards because I still needed a BMS to protect the battery pack. Instead, I would go on to design my own custom development board, which pretty much just fused the two, and then, of course, act like I made anything new. For reference, this is the part of the circuit we're talking about today, which is responsible for the USB-C stuff. The rest of it is for other functions we'll discuss in future videos. Now before we get into the programming and testing, I'd just like to give a quick thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring my channel with these awesome, high quality assembled PCBs. They're your one-stop shop for all your prototyping and manufacturing needs, and you can use my link in the description to get $5 off your first order and help support the channel. First, I tried to program the board with this I2C programmer I'd bought off of AliExpress, and after it completely didn't recognize the EEPROM chip whatsoever, I anticipated the worst. Was I really that amateur that I messed up routing one of the most basic devices in my whole circuit? I checked all the software variables on my PC, so it had to have been either my own circuit or the programmer. And if it was my circuit, how could I expect the hundreds of other features that I'd tried to implement to work? But when I hooked up an ESP32 to the I2C lines and it detected the EEPROM chip showing that it wasn't my custom PCB that was the issue, I came to the realization that A, the seller of this CH341A had absolutely scammed me, and B, I can just use any ordinary microcontroller with an I2C interface to load the firmware instead of a specialized programmer like I thought before. So with the help of everyone's favorite LLM, our first firmware revision was loaded and all I needed to do now was solder up a battery pack and plug it in. 
As it turns out, even my own labels for positive and negative that I had put on the PCB a few weeks prior for this specific reason weren't enough to prevent me from reversing the polarity and shorting out the battery like an absolute buffoon. Even though the PCB didn't seem damaged and the resistance of these frail little wires probably saved me from anything happening, I repeated the process with a new PCB and a new battery pack, and this time, when I connected the battery the right way, nothing blew up. But just because nothing blew up doesn't mean everything was working either. In sync mode, my max charging current was set to 4.5 amps or about 56 watts, which is well within the theoretical limit of both the wall charger and the circuit I used, and would yield a 0-100% to charging time of about 40 minutes for my 3 amp hour cells. And while the USB-C negotiation for this power level was working, providing a steady 20 volts to the battery charger chip, there was no charging current and it was only at the lower power profiles like 12 volts and 5 volts that it was behaving as expected and charging the battery with smaller currents. I thought this could have been hidden battery charger registers I had missed that I couldn't control, USB PD limits that were too tight that maybe I could control, or even just a straight up routing issue on my end, but ultimately, I couldn't find what it was at this stage. And in source mode, things weren't any better. Sure, it'd work with super small devices like keyboards, microphones, and mice, which would draw less than half an amp at 5 volts, but anything that wanted to draw more power was instantly shut down and had this weird resetting effect that could be due to so many different things I don't even have time to explain in this video. And after another 6 or 7 firmware revisions playing around with different settings, just to find out that source mode was actually working the whole time except only in my test setup, and somehow not with my own consumer electronic devices that literally draw less power, I came to the following conclusion. If I want to get this video out in any acceptable length of time, I kind of have to make myself look stupid on a forum. And look stupid on a forum I did. Turns out, I was trying to dissipate 4 watts of heat inside the battery charger chip in sync mode at 20 volts, which for reference, is like trying to run a CPU at full power without heat sinks or fans, and by reducing the charging current to 3 amps instead of 4.5 in the GUI, using the efficiency graphs in the datasheet, we're dissipating a fifth the heat, and everything's all happy in sync mode now with the battery finishing charging at a voltage of around 12.42 volts. I guess that 66 watt sync rating is likely for higher cell counts or when some of the current is going to charging the battery and some of it's going to the system. Still seems like a fair claim to me. But in source mode, things weren't as simple. Since I had pretty much copied the reference design component for component, we eventually determined that I did a good enough job placing the components and routing the PCB for it not to be an issue, especially since PCBWay was able to manufacture it with double thickness copper. Cables, connectors, and wall chargers were ruled out too, since these ones have been serving me for years without any issues whatsoever. All the voltages on the board checked out too, and my BMS, which we'll be discussing in the next video, didn't seem to have any issues either. So it had to have been something in firmware, and after tweaking my own settings for a while to no avail, Chris put together a setup with the official EVM and ended up having the same issues. But since he's an expert, he was quickly able to find the one pesky setting that was causing both of our systems to malfunction. And with that, everything was finally working with all of the USB-C functions we had planned to implement. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yep, let's go. Let's actually go. That's fl flowing that way. That also works. Special thanks to Chris and Jeff from the Texas Instruments e to e forums for pretty much saving this whole video. Special thanks to you guys for watching, and if you want to help support me even further, drop a comment down below and consider using some of the affiliate links that are in my description. I also have some links there to relevant literature if you want to understand these systems better for yourself, as well as the public troubleshooting forum which you can go view, so yeah, thanks, bye.